Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us here at Anderson House. My name is Paul Newman. I am the Museum Collections and Operations Manager here for the American Revolu Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation for the achievement of American independence, fulfilling the aim of the Continental Army officers and their French counterparts who founded the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783 to perpetuate the memory and legacy of the revolution. In addition to tonight's author's talk, the Institute fulfills that aim by supporting advanced study, developing exhibitions and other historical programs and tours, advocating historical preservation and providing resources to classrooms nationwide to benefit teachers, students and scholars alike. Since 1938, the society has done all of this work right here at its headquarters at Anderson House, a national historic landmark that was completed in 1905 as the winter residents of Isabel and Lars Anderson. Tonight's author's talk, a program that is made possible in part by a generous gift from the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati, features Dr. Ashley White discussing her book, Revolutionary Things, Material Culture and Politics in the Late 18th Century Atlantic World, recently published by Yale University Press. Ashley White is a professor of history and department chair at the University of Miami. She earned her PhD from Columbia University and specializes in early American history with a particular focus on the connections between North America and the Atlantic world. To date, most of her research has concentrated on the political, social, and cultural history of the age of revolution. She is the author of several books, including the award-winning Encountering Revolution, Haiti and the Making of the Early Republic published in 2010 by Johns Hopkins University Press. That explores the far-reaching impact of the Haitian Revolution on the early United States. Dr. White is also the recipient of various fellowships from the American Council for Learned Societies and the National Endowment for the Humanities, among others. Additionally, she was also the Associate Curator of Antillean Visions, Maps and the Making of the Caribbean of at the Low Art Museum, and this took, part, took place in February to May 2018, an award-winning exhibition that charted over 500 years of mapping of that region. By port, but before I turn things over to Dr. White, however, the usual housekeeping items are in order for our friends tuning in with our, us on Zoom this evening. Following tonight's author's talk, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions for Dr. White at any point during the presentation by using the Q&A function that can be found at the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to incorporate them with our live audience questions. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted using the chat function as one of our staff members will be monitoring that and we'll do our best to assist you. So with that and without further delay, please join me in welcoming to Anderson House, Dr. Ashley White. Thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Andrew, for the invitation and for making such wonderful arrangements. And thank you to everyone in the audience for, for coming out tonight on a lovely fall. Thank you, actually, for the amazing weather. Uh, it's a nice break from the Miami heat and humidity, which I know DC natives are well aware of. Uh, but in Miami, it lasts for like an additional three months with hurricanes to, to boot. Um, so when we reflect on the age of Atlantic revolutions, those sweeping political changes of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, one key question that informs our consideration is what inspired people to act so audaciously? And in looking to answer that query, we turn most often to texts, the declarations, speeches, pamphlets, and accounts that proliferated in this era. Through these works, we puzzle out what diverse actors in various locales meant when they called for and when they fought for revolution. And the dissemination of these texts across oceans helps us track the making of a transnational watershed. Right? Tonight, I want to suggest another approach 
to the issue of political ideology and motivation, namely through material culture. My exploration is animated by an interest in the ways that objects generated debate during the American, the French, and the Haitian revolutions. In other words, I wanna examine how certain things became revolutionary. Typically, we consider the political potential of material culture within the context of individual revolutions. In the United States, in France, in Haiti, objects were an important means through which Republican regimes introduced fresh motifs and slogans as part of their endeavors to sweep out old governments and to establish the legitimacy of new ones. But we also know that these political movements transcended national borders and so did material culture associated with them. As things with revolutionary affiliations migrated, they affected, not, rather than merely reflected, the contests at the heart of the American, French, and Haitian revolutions. These items shape people's understanding of key concepts like equality, freedom, and solidarity, and individuals turn to material culture to promote and sometimes to thwart the realization of these ideals on the ground. Actors with sundry backgrounds, enslaved and free, women and men, poor and elite, they all found opportunities through objects to participate in seminal debates of the era. Now, to be sure, not all things related to these three revolutions traveled to the same degree or crossed borders with the same ease. Some politicized objects, North American homespun or artifacts seized from French religious institutions, drums used by Haitian revolutionaries, to name just a few, their influence and breach were primarily national because they didn't circulate in sizable numbers outside of local contexts. Yet many revolutionary things did travel and they did so in significant quantities. So I track the Atlantic movement of diverse categories of job objects. So I look at ceramics, metalware and furniture. I look at military clothing and accessories like medallions. I look at maps and prints. And since we're close to Halloween, I also look at life-size wax figures. Now, some of these things originated at a revolutionary site and voyaged beyond it, while others were fabricated outside of the United States, France, or Haiti, but referred to those places. So for instance, British or American-made items about the French and Haitian revolutions. No matter their point of origin, these things contributed to making revolutions a transnational phenomenon. And I'll spare you looking at decapitated heads for a moment. Now in locating the precise political impact of these assorted things, an object's genre mattered in at least three ways. So first, the traits unique to a type of object, so a life-sized wax sculpture versus a printed portrait, for instance, that, that, um, those traits of the type determined its specific political capacity. So I explore how wax figures engaged with questions over violence, whereas printed portraits influenced debates about popular sovereignty. Second, not only did different objects speak to different issues, but each category had limits that were distinct to its form as well. These bounds were structural in terms of where and of what things were made. So an object's political possibilities were determined in part if it could be and was produced in Cap Francais or in Philadelphia or in Paris, and whether it was comprised of cloth or paper or ceramic. But the limits of revolutionary things were also socially constructed and that people had thresholds for tolerating alterations to aspects of their material world and to those of others. Some individuals were more willing and more able to change their dress accessories than their dinnerware. And lastly, on the importance of genre, 
context affected political influence. An object could promote or check change depending on who acquired and used it, how, where, and to what ends. So a Queensware platter owned by an enslaved person in Virginia had political valences distinct from one found in Duc d'Orléans households, right? So this tension across and within revolutionary things, that made them sites of contest as people teased out political prospects and encountered obdurate restrictions in the worlds of goods. I focus on this contest in the heat of, a mo of the moment from about 1770 to 1810, when participants and observers wrestled with events, agents, and ideas right as they surfaced, right? The quick succession of these three revolutions, and in the case of France and Haiti, their contemporaneity, that facilitates our inquiry into the effects of objects on the revolutionary present, instead of their role in nationalism and commemorations of the revolutionary past. So in sum, I look to recover the dynamism of Atlantic revolutionary things for the many individuals who interacted with them. To show this dynamism in action, I wanna focus our attention on one category of object. And since we're gathered in the headquarters of the Society of the Cincinnati, it seems appropriate to take uniforms as our case study. In terms of volume, military clothing is perhaps the most prolific revolutionary good because of the hundreds of thousands of men who needed it. These garments were issued to common soldiers annually, and sometimes more frequently because of the wear and tear wrought by warfare. As a result, during all three revolutions, governments measured clothing by the ton, with totals for single items, shirts, stockings, hat, tallying into the millions. What's more, administrations move these garments far and wide. They distributed them to men deployed throughout the Atlantic world. On, one, on the one hand, the politicization of military clothing is obvious, right? From the choice of color and the various insignia, like a red coat, right? Uniforms were designed to project the national loyalty of the wearer and to encourage a sense of common cause and belonging among fellow soldiers. But this evening, we will explore another equally powerful political component to uniforms, one that derives from their being textiles. To uncover this other layer of meaning, we need to understand the social practices surrounding textiles in the 18th century and examine how they took on unique features in the military realm. So to that end, we will consider the value of clothing, its means of acquisition, especially by common soldiers, and finally, what soldiers actually wore. With each of these facets, we will see how uniforms offered opportunities for common soldiers to deploy the language of rights. In contrast to the disposability of garments today, individuals in the early modern period had fewer articles of clothing because cloth, especially for items like coats, was expensive. As a result, textiles were prized by people of all walks of life, and this fundamental understanding of value carried over into a military context. In fact, during the age of revolutions, military-issued garments were more commonly called clothing than uniforms, because what men wore on the battlefields was not so far removed from the ordinary apparel of free men. By the mid 18th century, the suit, a coat, breeches, and a waistcoat, right? That was the norm. Uh, uh, and military uniforms drew on this familiar form, right? The parity between civilian and military garments, as far as form, that enhanced their worth for a soldier because, unlike other army issued items, a soldier took his clothing with him at the conclusion of his service. Now the economic impact of these garments was most substantial for black soldiers. 
For centuries, the master class enforced the status of enslaved people through dress. And you can see several different types of men pictured here. On Atlantic plantations, masters dispensed to black men a few items yearly, a couple of shirts and trousers or enough fabric to sew them, usually of course cheap material. The deliberate choice of inferior material and the absence of culturally significant items like coats, hats, and shoes, that was meant to underscore the degraded station of the enslaved. Sometimes enslaved people who worked in the household or coachmen, they acquired better articles and casts off from masters' families. And whenever possible, enslaved people supplemented their meager apparel with items bought from markets, stores, and traveling salesmen, if they had the wherewithal. In some colonies, like actually French Saint-Domingue, sumptuary laws buttressed racial and sartorial hierarchies. Free people of African descent and the enslaved in the Caribbean were prohibited from wearing certain garments and specific materials because white men and women feared the challenges clothing could pose to racist notions of white superiority. So given this context for clothing, military garments represented an economic, because they were valuable, but also a social boon for Black men in the age of revolutions. Although the benefit for Black men was impressive, clothing mattered to common white men too. Sometimes the rank and file were caricatured as the dregs of mankind, yet its actual composition was much more diverse with large numbers of artisans, for example, filling out the ranks. 18th century free men had a greater number and variety of garments, certainly in comparison to earlier generations. So the average wardrobe of a Parisian artisan, for instance, consisted of between 15 and 20 principal articles. Whereas in the previous century, in the 17th century, a craftsman had two or three changes of daytime clothing. But even with this marked growth from the 17th century to the 18th century, the addition of an entire new suit every year represented a considerable increase for a poor or middling white man. So when considering the value of clothing, it's worth noting that military clothing was not free. Because a common soldier lacked the wherewithal to equip himself from head to toe, he agreed to the garnishing of his wages to defray the costs of his attire. So in other words, black and white soldiers bought their clothing from an army suppliers and agents, which meant they had rights to it as owners. This distinction is important because in the civilian world, textiles were imbued with unique traits of possession. Some societies attached textile ownership to the person who wore it, including to married women, and the enslaved who lacked legal claims to other forms of property. And this ownership, this like cultural understanding of ownership, that gave owners as well as purchasers, right? The ability to exercise certain rights over their clothing. They could sell it, they could trade it, they could gift it, they could alter it, right? This consensus around textile rights, we could call them, didn't change the legal standing of the enslaved or married women, right, who are legally disenfranchised in other ways. But in a military and revolutionary context, it had political prospects for black and white men, given the mechanisms through which garments were obtained. All soldiers were quick to defend their right to military clothing because it was one of the few tangible aspects of their pay. During the Revolutionary Wars, each army set a daily wage rate for soldiers, but they rarely saw any of it in specie. Compensation was gobbled up by deductions for provisions, contributions to the hospital, commissions to the unit's agent, and clothing, among other commitments. Administrators ascribed a monetary value to each garment so that governments and men knew the exact amounts subtracted from soldiers' wages. Congress, for example, annually set prices for the Continental Army. So in 1778, a coat was valued at $25, a vest at nine, a shirt at eight, breeches, 10. Officials devised elaborate organizational charts 
uh, for tracking these deductions, right? And actually this is from the National Archives in Kew, and this is just a portion of a chart that spreads out this wide, keeping track of clothing that's dispersed to one regiment in, in one year. So there are all these kinds of charts for tracking clothing, but in practice on the ground, systems were chaotic. In 1780, when a commission investigated the British Army's finances, it found the bureaucratic labyrinth around pay so impenetrable that the committee, as one scholar has described it, quote, abandoned its task in despair, just sort of gave up, um, which I like. All right, so the upshot was that the clothing was the most concrete evidence of wages that a soldier witnessed. It was material, it was valuable, it belonged to him, and it lasted longer than a meal. Just as importantly, the chain of command recognized a soldier's clothing, a, a, a soldier's clothing prerogative, one of the few. So whether fighting for or against revolution, common soldiers relinquished many rights, submitting to military law and to the orders of their superiors. Right? Soldiers at times resented and they tested these constraints. Yet they had little leverage since with enlistment, they consented to military authority. But the arrangement with clothing established an obligation. Since a soldier paid for his garments, the military had a duty to deliver them in a timely manner. When clothing did not arrive at the designated time, commanding officers took soldiers' grievances seriously. So in March 1777, Captain Robert Kirkwood of the Continental Army read to his men a letter from headquarters in which, and this is him paraphrasing, the general, Washington, is very sorry there should be so much foundation for the frequent complaints of the soldiery respecting their pay and clothing. He is very sensible of these difficulties and promises everything in his power to have them speedily redressed. Now, perhaps the men found some humor in the unintentional pun about speedy redressing, right? Because like they want to be dressed, but anyway. But the letter's phrasing is revealing for its recognition of the justness of soldiers' complaints and an expressed commitment to do something about them. Now, the Caribbean theater shows the degree to which the acceptance of a soldier's right to clothing proliferated the army. After the American Revolution, the Carolina Corps of Loyalist and mostly Black troops was reassigned to Grenada, and they ended up serving actually throughout the Leeward Islands. Governor Edward Matthew insisted that the men be paid and clothed, as they had been during the U.S. War of Independence. This directive sparked debate among some white planters because of the perceived threat to racial hierarchies. Nevertheless, Matthew enforced this standard, albeit with mixed results. In 1788, he protested to superiors that for three years had his men had paid for, yet not received their clothing. The Treasury agreed to supply the garments. However, two years later, agents for the Union pressed officials for the outstanding balance. They're still not getting their due. Now, on the one hand, the case of the Carolina Corps points to how the right to clothing pervaded the military to such an extent that it applied to black soldiers. On the other hand, it illustrates the frustrations and limited recourse of officers and men when shipments of clothing did not appear. This was a constant problem for all armies during the age of revolution. The Haitian Revolutionary General Toussaint Louverture sent numerous missives to higher ups pleading for clothing for his soldiers. He wrote, it is very painful for a commander who has seen his forces endure thirst and hunger and be exposed to the greatest danger to expel the British from the territory of Saint-Domingue. It is painful, I repeat, to behold these very soldiers deprived even of such basic clothing. Now, racism, to be sure, exacerbated the situation of black soldiers, yet deficient clothing stock affected troops in all armies, right? And you know this from Valley Forge, right? Without the ability to produce the necessary quantities of cloths, North American and Caribbean revolutionaries relied heavily on European imports, whether they were purchased, donated, or seized. And all of these modes of acquisition were inconsistent. If 
even British and French forces suffered from supply glitches. The sheer task of outfitting so many men pressed to the capacity of manufacturers who made literally tons of cloth for the military annually. Transatlantic shipments were plagued by periodic shortages of vessels, by timing mishaps, administrative infighting, and the fog of war. Some officials tried to diffuse soldiers' exasperation through appeals to sacrifice. After Louverture yet wrote another letter about inadequate provisions, the colony's commissioner, Le Gère Felicité Sotenex, he regaled the general with episodes from the American and French revolutions when poorly equipped um, and outnumbered soldiers emerged victorious. Sotenax urged Louverture to remind the Republicans under your command of these heroic traits. According to Sotenax, deprivation was part and parcel of wars against despotism, but such explanations had their limits among soldiers and intractable clothing, lack of clothing led to protest. John Robert Shaw joined a US soldiers march in Philadelphia to express, as he put it, our grievances such as no pay, no clothing, without which we could serve no longer. That demonstration was successful, but others were not so lucky. On the march in the winter of 1776, General Lee lost about 2,700 out of a total of 3,000 men. And he claimed that they, they went for want of clothing. They deserted because of clothing. Repeating clothing shortfalls offered opportunities for common soldiers to assert their rights. But this, their sense of rights went beyond mere acquisition to include a keen understanding of quality. When clothing shipments were delivered, soldiers were not content to accept just any garment. They knew that not all shirts, for instance, were alike, and these differences in condition mattered. The better the shirt, the longer it lasted, and the more a soldier felt that he got the value he deserved. When the American soldier Joseph Plum Martin traveled with his lieutenant to retrieve clothing for their unit, his superior officer told him to, quote, take care of my own interest. I accordingly picked from the best of each article what was allowed to each man and bundled them up by themselves. So he's like picking through the pile and pulling out the best for himself. Men expected the garments to reflect the degree of quality for which they paid. And they objected to inferior goods, at times refusing to accept them on principle. As one soldier described it, some garments were, quote, not fit for the devil to wear. The persistent problems with clothing black and white soldiers throughout the age of revolutions and the dogged discrepancies between what they paid for and what was distributed, that begs a pretty basic question, namely, so what did soldiers actually wear? Well, soldiers' clothing was already freighted with political implication because of the manner of its procurement, these garments take on greater significance when we consider their lived reality. Posing this question is easier than answering it, because although armies kept records about the articles soldiers were supposed to get, they did not record what men did wear. Nor do many garments worn by the rank and file, especially the rank and file, but even among officers, very few of them survive. So the most consistent source base that I've found is advertisements for deserters. And so I built a searchable database from their largest available cache of about 215 cases from North America between 1776 and 1783. They afford a glimpse into a, a sartorial reality of US soldiers. And it reveals the extent to which soldiers could and could not leverage the ideological power of wearing military clothing. So let's focus on coats, which were the most prized article in both economic and social terms because they were the most expensive and the most prominent garments for military and civilian men. In a military context, they were essential to the coveted idea of sartorial uniformity, right? Even as they bore the weight of like honorifics that signaled rank and other distinctions. Of 
over half of the deserter advertisements use the term regimental, soldier, regular, or uniform to denote a coat with military provenance. So about half of them. The rest were distinguished by known types that were known among civilian clothing, surtout, watch, frock fashion. They were also known by cut, long, short, straight bodied, by notable features like quilting. All of these are found in civilian dress too. The predominant color of coats when noted was mostly blue, but there was a strong proportion of brown. There were a smattering of greens, of gray, and even reds. About a quarter of the coats were turned up with contrasting colors at the collar, lapel, or cuffs, which are all signs of military uh, distinction. A slim majority of the coats were made of the preferred fabric of broadcloth, but there were also co coats made of homespun, out of blankets, of calico, linen, shag, like, like the 1970s carpet, right, among others. So this very brief overview of cut, color, detail, fabric, it shows the diversity among soldiers' most noticeable garment, the one that was intended to give them collectively a homogeneous look. Now, some of this variety resulted from differences between regiments, right? But it can be found within individual units, too. So of the four deserters from Captain Park's company, each man wore a different coat, one was light colored face with blue. The second was a blue uniform face with red. The third was described simply as short, light, and colored. And the last was a, Brid a British regimental dyed brown with, right, with white edging. Moreover, soldiers paired semi-conformable coats with non-regulation garments. A brown regimental coat with a striped waistcoat, for example. A blue one with brown linen breeches. You get the idea. So this mixture of regulation with non-regulation garments reflected in part supply glitches, right? But some of the ensembles these soldiers wore suggest that even within a military context and even with very limited means, black and white men found ways to express their senses of style within the military. I'll give you a few examples. So William Bostwick, who was a white deserter from a Colonel Swift's regiment in Connecticut, he had a remarkable getup. It was described, he wore a round brimmed hat with a red and blue cockade, which is like a little uh, emblem at the top, a pepper and salt coat, a red and white flowered vest, good leather breeches, gray stockings, and flowered shoe buckles. Like, you look good. Sometimes assertions of individual lay in the details. So a shoemaker who had run away had very nondescript clothing, but in the advertisement, they lavished a long description of his shoes, which were long corded shoes of wax neat leather closed in the inside on the grain. James Anderson was a black ditcher with the 6th Virginia Regiment, and he wore a light gray coat faced with green, but his, his point of distinction was a small hat that had a piece of bear skin on it. And this was an honorific that was reserved for members of some prestigious units, which actually excluded black soldiers. So just how he came by this accessory remains a mystery. Yet his appropriation of it suggests that black men were as attuned to the subtleties of sartorial distinction as their white peers. Now for every William Boswick, there were many, many more deserters whose only article worth mentioning was an old blanket or a homespun coat with Onsenberg trousers and a felt hat. So in the context of this variegated and often distressed clothing landscape, encounters with men who realize the martial sartorial ideal or even key components of it that resonated really strongly with so few men dressed in the regulation uniforms for which they paid. Those who manage the feet broadcast political statements bolder than we have realized. Men in full uniform claimed the economic, social, and cultural values imbued in those textiles, which among civilians announced their entitlements as owners, and within the army, demanded an equality of station, a right to be treated like any other member of their rank. 
Now, the political import of this was most radical for men of African descent, given the material and ideological degradation that accompanied slavery and racism, and how some revolutionaries challenged both. We might expect sartorial brilliance among leading officers from the Haitian Revolution. So Toussaint Louverture there on the left, Henri Christophe in the middle, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, among others, were often portrayed in complete military regalia. Depictions of common black soldiers in full uniform are even more powerful. Uh, during the American Revolution, Jean-Baptiste Antoine de Verger a sub-lieutenant of the Royal du Point Regiment from what is now Switzerland, he sketched four soldiers. This is a famous sketch, but it's important. Uh, a black infantryman from the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, a musketeer from the 2nd Canadian Regiment, an American rifleman and a gunner from the Continental Artillery. So moving from left to right. Among the four men, it's the white rifleman who deviates most from the martial model. The side view shows off not only his unorthodox hunting shirt, but also his pouch, axe, powder horn, and rifle. While the attire of the black soldier differs from that of all three white men, those differences stem from the distinctions of his unit. He, more so than the rifleman, exemplifies military aspirations in his clothing and accoutrement. He is equal in sartorial stature and military bearing to the white musketeer and the gunner with whom he is pictured. Verger's observations did not circulate outside his journal, yet they, as well as those of others, shed light on the thousands of interactions between black and white men who sized up one another's clothing on the battlefield, in camp, and on the march. Several images of black soldiers, like those from Marcus Rainford's 1805 and a historical account of the Black Empire of Haiti, were published and distributed among audiences located away from the theaters of war. In this plate that you see here, a black private who is the lowest ranking soldier in the French Republican army is impeccably dressed. From his cockaded and feathered hat and smartly cut coat to his form-fitting breeches and shiny black boots, he radiates martial sophistication. A few eccentricities are meant to signal his Caribbean roots, so the large hoop earring and the turban-like shape of the hat. But for anyone, civilian or soldier seeing the print, it would be hard to deny the fine quality and worth of his garments and his economic and cultural ability to conform to martial sartorial ideals. When white men met uniformed black soldiers in the field or as images of them moved throughout the Atlantic world, their attire spoke volumes about the wherewithal that was threaded through each garment and of the rights of possession over that clothing. In an age of revolutions, this material statement had political overtones. Free men of African descent who served in the Jamaica militia during the American Revolution expressed this connection overtly. Protesting exclusion from hurricane relief funds, they reminded the colonial assembly of their military service. They wrote, as good citizens, and in arms as soldiers, they have always done and are still ready to do their utmost to in defense of the British constitution. As concrete evidence of their loyalty, they cited their hefty outlay to clothe themselves in regimentals. And for that contribution, they contended that they deserved equitable treatment as citizens. So to claim equal status via military clothing after centuries of degradation, men of African descent advanced one of the most radical and tangible claims of the age of revolutions. They used military conventions to insist on an equality that few among the master class were ready to accept. Napoleon Bonaparte and his advisors in Saint-Domingue grasped the immense ideological power of black men in uniforms when they decided in 1801 to try to reinstitute slavery on the island. Bonaparte summed up the motivation for the project in sartorial terms. As he put it, he could no longer, quote, tolerate a single epaulette on the shoulders of black men. Right? Force, however, was the only way to remove them. 
because after all, like the coats on which they were sewn, the epaulets belonged to the black soldiers who wore them. For all its hierarchical pretensions, military clothing offered hundreds of thousands of black and white men throughout the Atlantic world, a material means through which to argue for equality. Identifying the fullness of this challenge has required a reconsideration of these garments in their 18th century context. Among some scholars, there is a tendency to see the nuances of material culture, say the various coats of cuts of, of coats or types of cloth. There's a tendency to see these as kind of antiquarian concerns. But for actors at the time, they were timely and telling. They informed their understandings of the economic, social, and political value of clothing. And so tonight we've worked to recover this texture so that we can appreciate the depth of meaning of these items in a revolutionary age. Now certainly, this material articulation of equality was not the lofty notion enshrined in the Declaration of Independence or the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, although for people of African descent and for women, these avowals fell far short. Right? Yet the equality of military clothing was for many men palpable and valuable, it was evident in their presence, and it was practical in ways that declarations sometimes were not. And when, for sundry and often legitimate reasons, regimes failed to live up to their contractual obligations with military clothing, soldiers, black and white, gave voice to their discontent in terms, including rights, that were accepted. Governments responded to these demands as best they could, frequently to serve their own purposes of reinforcing the hierarchies that were central to armies' effectiveness. Right? But in the process, the soldiers had opportunities to see and to express themselves as worthy of equal treatment, a vision that had enormous political consequences, as men of African descent used these European-made instruments of war to attack, literally and figuratively, slavery and racism. In, clothing, in closing, I'd like to suggest that this material view of ideology is important to interpretations of the US, French, and Haitian Revolution. Because things were, and they still are, vital to human existence, right? sometimes perhaps more so than texts, which is the usual source for histories of revolutionary politics. Whether enslaved or free, poor or elite, male or female, Late 18th century individuals lived in material worlds in which people acted on things and were affected by them too. And given this fundamental condition, we cannot comprehend the achievements and limitations of this defining era without taking the consequences of things seriously. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. Can you say anything about the survival? Oh, can you say anything about the survival of um, of uh, Revolutionary War uniforms uh, from any of these uh, um, and any class of of uh, soldiers? Because I think textiles in general don't survive very well, and so maybe you're drawing inferences from just a few items and. Well, the, you're right in that very few garments from this period survive, whether they're civilian or military. And the ones that tend to survive are usually the best ones, right? Um, they're those that are owned by elite um, because people tend to save what's particularly prized uh, and they tend to, to pass it down, right? So the, the items that survive, the garments that survive are, are mostly from the elite. And in the case of military clothing, it's from officers. But even those examples are actually relatively few. So yes, I've looked at examples of officers' clothing in in various repositories where they survive, Colonial Williamsburg, for example, and elsewhere. But in order to fill in actually what was the majority of clothing, 
one has to turn actually to archives and to the document trail, to things like those advertisements, right? Um, we don't have, I don't think, um, like those deserter advertisements are about 215, right? The, the volume I was seeing and the for the British Army in Q were tens of thousands every year, sometimes more, multiply that over, right? We don't have that material evidence of clothing. Looking at the clothing that does survive though, tells you a good deal about how they were constructed, ideally, uh, people's individual preferences. Um, and so that is extraordinarily useful. But in order to get a sense of what common soldiers wore, I had to do a digging around in a lot of in a lot of archives in order to fill that in. So I tried to have a conversation of the uh, with the things that do survive, which are usually um, a portion and a, a portion skewed in a particular direction, with the millions of things that don't survive, um, to try to recreate in a way. Um, a vision of this material world in an, in an age of revolution. Are there very many um, existing uh, artifacts or paintings of the uniforms that the Haitians wore in mm -hmm. fighting the British in the American Revolution? So the, the Haitians who were brought here fight on the side of the French. Right, during the Battle of Savannah, for example, and at Yorktown, yeah. yeah. So there are some, um, there's some depictions of what, what they were wearing at the Battle of Savannah. Usually um, those are textual descriptions, sometimes of the ideal. They would have been dressed often um, in the manner of other French soldiers. There are Caribbean variants on what exactly that looked like, because that's the 1770s. By the time you get to the 1790s with the French Revolution, um, black soldiers who are fighting on the side of the French Republican regime, and, when, and then it eventually turns into the Haitian Revolution of War of Independence when France tries to reinstitute slavery, um, they would have been wearing the garment, if they got a hold of it, right? Louverture complains about it constantly, of the French Republican Army, right? And, and that changes over time, that ideal. Um, but that was that was how they were supposed to be dressed. But the ideal is there's always a gap between the ideal and actually what happens. And one of the things I noticed in my research is on the ground constantly um, because of gaps, uh, uh, supply glitches or making do with what they have, officers in their units are rewriting uh, the ideal in order to try and make some kind of uniformity on the ground. But time and time again, that was extraordinarily difficult. You displayed a, a portrait, a picture of uh, a, by a French artist. There were four soldiers, French. Yeah. There. This, and the, to the left, that soldier on the left is carrying a, the same type of uh, munition, uh, a rifle as a French soldier. Mm -hmm. But he's often attributed as a from Rhode Island. That's right. And I was just wondering, even though he's sort of dressed as a, it's a Haitian, a Haitian soldier mm -hmm. with French French well, uniform, yeah. how that got changed? Well, I think so. He he would be, the black regiments in the American Revolution, um, the ones that were had their own sort of well, it depended from Continental Army to militia, right? So he is actually American, a black American. Those from Saint-Domingue, the French colony of Saint-Domingue, now Haiti, right? Who would be going to say the Battle of Savannah would have had different uniforms to signal their ties to that Caribbean nation. And during the Asia Revolution, the script for what those are, garments are supposed to look like is constantly changing. They're, they're mucking with it all the time. Because it, it turns out it, it winds up in a university in Rhode Island, right? This, Brown. This is from Brown, yeah. And and um, and so someone comes in and says, "Oh, this is the uniform of uh, of the Rhode Island militia, mm -hmm. based on where the where they did their research, right. rather than possibly the reality that there were oh. thousands of French troops." Uh, 
of Haitian troops that fought in the American Revolution. And very little of that is documented anywhere among the historiography of, of, uh, in the United States. And what well, I think actually this has, I mean, each of these, each of these men come from different places, right? So Verger is, is, is Swiss. He's tied to the, the Continental Army and he moves north. I'm sure you know this, his journals, right? And he makes his way down to Yorktown. And as he's going, he's commenting on everybody he's seeing and he's sometime drawing sketches. And it's Verger who, who denotes where each of these people are from. And it just happens to end up in the collection of Brown University because um, Anne Brown was an avid collector of items related to the American Revolution, especially military collections. And she gave her collection to that institution. But you, you're you absolutely correct that in terms of the contribution of soldiers from, from Saint-Domingue to the American Revolution, we know much less um, than com in comparison to certainly other units from other places. Absolutely. But that's part of the that's part of the importance of thinking about these revolutions as transnational phenomenon. These men are moving. As I argue today, their objects are moving. Um, and the ties between the US and Saint Domingue, now Haiti, go go way back. But I could talk about that for a really long time. Yes. In talking about black soldiers in uh, the American uh, units as well as the Haitian units, these are stories that we don't hear, stories that I think are sort of not told often about the American Revolution. Uh, likewise, uh, the role of the French is often not given much emphasis. Uh, but I wonder if you just might talk about attitudes towards black soldiers as being equal in status, uh, mm -hmm. playing uh, the role of, of full, you know, common soldiers in America uh, versus France, versus European attitudes. Well, I think um, in both situations, right, from if you, if you trace the arc from the US to the French and the Haitian revolutions, black soldiers in all of those venues faced an enormous degree of racism. Like there's, there's, um, there's, that was part and parcel of their, of their experience within, as, as, as part of, uh, as part of the military, right? I guess one of the things I point to with the uniforms is that becomes a kind of visual way, um, an understood signal to push back against that when black men were able in all of these venues, whether it be in the United States during the American Revolution, um, there aren't there are some black soldiers fighting in France and Europe during the, the French Revolution, um, and and then certainly throughout the Caribbean in 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 both during the time of both the U.S. and the French Revolution, and then what becomes the Haitian Revolution. So racism is an endemic; it's not upended, even when France um, from pressure from uh, black forces in Saint-Domingue agrees to abolish slavery in 1794 and grant citizenship to black men, right? There's that move in the declaration in February of 1794, but the rest of the war is, is fought to try to make that a reality on the ground, right? Britain is invading Saint-Domingue in order to, to change that. Spain is trying to come in from the other side of the island. And so these black soldiers are, are, are fighting a revolution, but they're also fighting a, a, a multi-sided battle against slavery and racism too. Um, and I think if we understand uh, the magnitude of that challenge um, and we think about what it means then uh, for these men to be wearing this clothing when some of their white counterparts aren't able to. And, and some many black soldiers were obviously like many white common soldiers unable to, to have full uniforms, even though they too paid for them. You understand the kind of political charge that, that they were projecting. Thank you for that question. In the ad, uh, the advertisements that you mentioned uh, for soldiers abandoning their posts, um, 
what what would be the the likelihood of soldiers actually attempting to disguise themselves, yeah. disguise their affiliations? Is, mm -hmm. is it possible some of those aren't accurate descriptions of what yeah. units would be wearing? Yeah, it's a it's a good question and and something I wrestled with when thinking uh, thinking about how to use this evidence, and I came to a couple of conclusions. One. Most of these men had limited wardrobes, and so they could only disguise so much, right? And it was interesting in the advertisements if um, the officer in charge pointed out about goods that had been stolen, right? So then you know that they're stealing them and trying to disguise, right? But what's fascinating to me is the way that officers knew what these people were wearing, could describe it in such detail, right? which also suggested to me that they had seen those people in those outfits, that there were distinctive features. Um, and there was a, in the 18th century, people people knew, often knew, it was, if, if you think about it, it's an age before uh, your ability to, to circulate a photograph or an image of a person's face. And so the view of looking how people identified others was often through their clothing. That was a more effective way to describe somebody because people had fewer way, uh, fewer outfits and therefore you saw somebody in the same coat all the time, right? Or maybe you saw two coats. Um, and so I, I came to the conclusion that these, to be sure, there's some obfuscation or attempts perhaps to disguise, but given my sense of people's um, depth of wardrobes, it seemed really hard to pull off. Yeah, but thank you. It's a great methodological question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for an interesting presentation. Uh, during the uh, Revolutionary War, the, the Blacks in this country actually sided with the British because they expected to get the freedom. Yeah, if, some of them did. If the British would won the, the war, but then they fought with the, for the most part, on on the British side. Yeah, there's an that's correct. So there are a number of 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 uh, enslaved people, enslaved men, and actually in women and children who fled to the British side, in because of Dunmore's proclamation that became a kind of well, impetus yeah. for them to to enlist. And as part of that, received their freedom, but they were often exiled afterwards. Right? Now, the the interest of Brown University in uh, this as this picture indicates is, I think, derived from the fact that uh, uh, General Rochambeau in 1780 actually landed in in an island with a contingency of 5,000 soldiers, and then he convinced General Washington instead of sieging New York City. Uh, the best strategy would be to move down to, to Yorktown mm -hmm. to corner uh, Cornwallis, which they did very successfully. So they fought jointly. Actually, more French soldiers marched to Yorktown than Americans, and they were really took, uh, you know, did a great job in um, in, in uh, succeeding in that uh, victory. They made a uh, substantial contribution. Now, some of the um, officers, of French officers, a uh, young officer that served in that campaign actually, I think, as you pointed out later on, turned out to be very successful uh, generals in uh, Napoleon's army. That's right. Uh, foremost, uh, Louis Alexander Berthier, a logistical genius who was uh, who served as Napoleon's chief of staff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, there, there are other examples, but anyway. Just... And, the, and the son of Rochambeau? is actually um, one of the generals, uh, one of the French generals during the Haitian Revolution. Uh, but his career doesn't actually go so well with the Haitian Revolution. So you're right in that the, if one could trace the careers of several of these officers in particular, it's easier to trace the officers than the common soldiers that are moving among these, right? Which speaks to a kind of uh, interconnectedness among these three, three revolutions. To be sure. Thank you, Mr. Silvestri. Dr. White, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about your research process a little bit and kind of the, the genesis of this project, you know, expanding beyond text to look at material culture, but having spent a lot of time with text to find material culture. And, you know, were you looking at a particular item and it got you thinking about reading these as sources or how you read about a particular item and it got you thinking of, of the interplay between the description and the physical? 
Yeah, thank you. So some it's a bit of both to be sure. So I um I was very privileged at a, a point in my career to attend the Winchester program and do their their master's program before going on to to get my PhD. So um I was immersed in the 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 um, material culture of of Winchester and, and got to learn about a variety of things and that that influenced my my training as a as a scholar in many ways. But the the genesis for this book came from uh, my first book where I was coming across references to things that were circulating and and the first thing that caught my attention were these life size wax figures. Um, and a few of them survived. The ones I showed you are actually of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie uh, Marie Antoinette that Madame Tussaud crafted and took with her um, to start Tussaud's museum in in London. Um, so it was this it was this dialogue of hunting down things that survived, um, and putting them in conversation with all types of of documents. So I I looked at newspapers, I looked at private correspondence, I looked at bureaucratic records, a lot of bureaucratic records, um, to try to to think about, um, I guess in the conclusion, I talk about what remains and what does not remain and, and to resuscitate the two. But for me, it was transformational to look at certain objects and 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 encounter their three-dimensionality. So um, Jay Silvestri knows that uh, together, we worked on an exhibition at the University of Miami on uh, maps in the Caribbean. And, and working with those maps in special collections and elsewhere, and spending the close time encountering those objects and the sort of dedicated looking, that informed actually uh, my hunt for other maps, but also the way that I was following things in archives and, and libraries. An amazing moment in my uh, in the making of this book was I was lucky enough to to do some research at the Musée Carnavalet, which is the Museum of the Study of Paris, which has an enormous collection of French Revolutionary things, which is truly awesome. And they let me into the storage closets where I could open the drawers of, well, actually they opened the drawers for me, but I got to peer into them. Um, and it was just full of all these little cockades and tiny medallions that had been saved from, from the French Revolution. And seeing that sheer variety, and again, looking, sort of encountering them in three dimensions and, and thinking about what it took to make them. And, and it just leads you down all these other questions um, and their associations. So, for me, it was um, an extraordinary learning experience of trying to be as interdisciplinary as possible. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, what it, one thing I hope this book does is that it encourages folks who are committed to archives and libraries and folks who are committed to museums to have amazing conversations across their media and across their institutions and disciplines. Um, because in my experience in doing this book, that was that was transformative for the ways I thought about the age of revolutions. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the distribution and production of these um, of these uniforms. What, what kind of workshops were they? Who who was doing this? <laughs> yeah. The material. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um thank you. That was I I took as um as my as my case study into this what was considered to be the best system for that, and that was the British. And, and because the British were involved in all three revolutions, fighting against them, but in all three of them, um they were seminal. And so what you see is that in the 18th century, there were not dedicated manufacturers that were tied to the military and the government. There were, as you know, if you think about the sort of the beginnings of what becomes the Industrial Revolution, textile manufacturing was key to that in a place like um, Britain. But it is pretty decentralized. It goes through various bureaucratic channels that overlap and were not necessarily clear. But essentially, you'd have um, agents who would go to manufacturers, and those agents for a particular regiment would have a list of what that regiment needed. 
um, that agent would purchase it uh, on behalf of the regiment. Um, officers had to pay their own, but common men, it was supposed to come out of their pay. And in the British case, then all of those garments had to go out in armed convoys because very early in the American Revolution, they realized that clothing shipments were being taken by pri privateers because the cloth was so valuable. So they had been sending them out unarmed and then they realized, no, they needed to go in armed convoys. But there's there are all these gaps of things not making it to, not making it to the right place. One of the things I also discovered among all the armies is that soldiers did a lot of sewing. So often with enlistment, one of the artisans they looked for were tailors. And tailors would be put into units. And in the winter months, they were sewing um, to make, sometimes cloth was shipped. And if you looked at some of the manifests, you would see things like thread, scissors, um, some for repair, but also for making from whole cloth. Soldiers, individual soldiers, were also attending common soldiers to their own kit. So they're great episodes in the, in the chapter in the book, which is, so this is just a part of it. Um, I talk about how um, soldiers were cutting out their own breeches and sewing them together, or they would turn to local women, local tailors, other men, other men who had skills, to sew things for them. They swapped things in camp all the time. This upset officers all the time because they were looking for a better fit or something that suited them. Um, and so it's funny that you think of the clothing being made and coming across, but there are all these other channels, all these needs for alterations. Um, and what struck me is how men knew so much about textiles and had so much skill with textiles. Women, certainly, but in these situations, they were they were sewing and tending. They were not knitting. Um, I didn't discover any men knitting, but men sewing, common men sewing, for sure. Thank you. Dr. Wood, I do want to, uh, you've covered a lot of the questions on Zoom, but um, I do want to hit one more before we uh, wrap up here. Uh, we do have a question from an attendee. Uh, He's asking, could you uh, provide an example of how, for example, Queen's wear, Jasper wear of the revolutionary period or other similar types of objects of material culture could be understood as time specific elements of material culture, particularly among the elite classes of the period? In terms of, well, with ceramics, I would say um, one of the things, what I traced, I, th I think when you, well, if you're, if you're into your American revolutionary material culture, maybe, and actually here at the Smithsonian, one of the most famous revolutionary objects they have is that uh, teapot, that Queensware teapot that says like no stamp act, right? And on the other side, it says stamp act revealed. Have you seen this? No? You should go to the Smithsonian. You live in DC. You should go. It's awesome. All right. So there are these, there were Queensware is like a, a, a plain, relatively plain, right? Let me go back. Oh, no. Sorry. I think I botched it. Um, a relatively plain white ceramic um, that, that could take all kinds of design, right? But the most typical one was just prized actually for its, its, its tidiness, its cleanliness, and the fact that it was relatively cheap. And what I discovered with um, within the context of the American Revolution and with the French Revolution, it's faience, usually people look to things that are decorated with revolutionary Republican slogans, right? So no stamp act, or um, in the case of the French Revolution, uh, something that has a, a, a celebration of various motifs that shift pretty quickly during the, the French Revolution. Um, but, but what I was interested in, those are actually, the French faience, there's a lot of it, but those enamel, those those uh, decorated plates from Queensware were were actually very rare. They were more difficult to produce, and it's not what Wedgwood was producing a lot. Um, and so, what I was interested in when it came to Wedgwood are the planer wares and how he tries to get them into new markets because of revolution. That suddenly some of these plain cleanware. Uh, Queensware plates can show up in in uh, French Saint Domingue, 
um, during the Haitian Revolution, and that there's a kind of way that old goods take on new political valences within new contexts. Revolution opens up opportunities for them to shift. So I guess that's not an elite take really on uh, on Queensware, although Washington was buying piles of it during the American Revolution. Um, and so he too was interested in these old goods. Jeff's Beware mostly comes down to medallions. Um, those are, are um, responding to the times much more quickly than dinnerware because of the ways that they operate. But um, I probably don't have time to talk about it now. And I would say, open the book <laughs> and, you'll, and, and you'll see um, my analysis of why those things that are both ceramic operate really differently because of the size, the intention and the price and who can get a hold of them. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a great way to end. Uh, go buy the book so. <laughs> and go to the Smithsonian. I mean, or go to the Smithsonian. Guys, really? Start there. It's uh, free. Yeah. No, I want to thank you, Dr. White, for coming uh, up, making the trip up here to speak for us here at Anderson House. For all of you for coming out tonight and uh, for everybody at, at home or wherever you are joining us virtually. So uh, thank you very much. Okay. We will see you next week. And uh, thank you again for your support of our mission. So get home safe, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks. Have a wonderful night, folks.